Uh, I'd like to introduce my guest tonight by reading what Time magazine wrote about her in 1966. To grown men, she is a lady. This is Time talking. To housewives, the gal next door. To little children, the most huggable aunt of all. She is Christmas carols in the snow, a companion by the fire. Read poetry to on a cold winter's night. Does anyone know whom that bit of prose is describing? Well, if you guessed Rona Barrett, and I am happy to say that Julie Andrews is my guest tonight, and I am happy to report that she has survived that uh, rather uh, saccharine uh, Time magazine description of her. If you just heard retching backstage, it might have been Julie Andrews. Uh, she has survived it brilliantly. Miss Andrews, of course, was the star of a whole lot of films like Mary Poppins and The Sound of Music and The Americanization of Emily. And uh, more recently, she's appeared in uh, several films directed by her husband, Blake Edwards, which included Ten and last year's S.O.B. Uh, lately, Miss Andrews had been in, um, taken in parts that I guess could be considered saucier than Mary Poppins. And in her new film, she has the very strange uh, task of portraying a woman who earns her living by impersonating a female impersonator. And I didn't get that wrong. That's not easy. Will you welcome, please, the incredibly versatile Julie Andrews. aware of that thing I read, aren't you? Um, that, that I read it exactly accurately, all those things you are. And I can't imagine somehow reading poetry to you on a cold winter's night. We'll try. But I, I may, if you give me the chance, yes, I'd be glad, be glad to try it. When people mention Mary Poppins, do you have a tendency to want to kick them in the shins? Uh, is it... No, not really. You're not so sick of that, that... Uh, no, listen, uh, it was a wonderful film, and uh, yeah. Disney's gave me my first big break in film. Sure. And it gave a lot of people an enormous amount of pleasure, so sure. I, I don't knock it. But uh, people do tend to think that a person is whatever they were in the film they saw them in, and people who only saw you in Mary Poppins probably would be surprised to learn that I saw you kicking small children outside the <laughs> stage door <laughs> and saying... Get away from me, you ragged little wretches. <laughs> well, <laughs> there was a time when I was taking my young daughter shopping just after Mary Poppins had uh, opened, and uh, she was really being a brat, I mean, really being difficult. And I said, honey, if you don't shape up, I'm really going to have to smack you on the butt. And she just persisted, and I figured she was saying, we'll do it, and let's see. So I hauled off, and I whacked her, and somebody said, oh, look, there's Mary Poppins. <laughs> go about very well. <laughs> I'm sure most people thought I misspoke when I was trying to describe your new role I, with the impersonating, the impersonator, impersonating. It's a little uh, confusing. It's a I was a little confused. Mirrors within mirrors. Yes. Could you straighten it out for me just a bit without giving away whatever you don't want people to know about the film? I uh, play a lady in Paris in the Depression in the 1930s, very down on her luck and uh, without a job, and she's persuaded by a friend to become a female impersonator. In other words, I play a lady who pretends to be a man who then pretends to be a lady. Make it any simpler? How do you go about keeping that straight? Uh, 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 you have to bear in mind that you are a woman mm -hmm. pretending to be a man pretending to be a woman. Well, it isn't always it. like that. I mean, a, a lot of the film, I'm pretending to be a man uh, and wondering how people see me and what am I really feeling inside? Am I really pretending to be a man? Am I with a lady's feelings inside mm -hmm. the mask and so on? It was difficult. Did you have to get any advice from about how to walk, how well, to stand? Well, I, I thought about it a lot and I watched a lot of men, a little more than usual, and mm -hmm. uh, um, I asked some questions. When I, whenever I was really in trouble, I asked Robert Preston or James Garner, who were both in the film, yeah. and uh, I have a lot of different costumes to wear, so uh, I, I really needed some answers. Like, you know, when you're in a full uh, di um, white tie and tails, you know, how, mm -hmm. what does a man do with his hands? Does he put them in his pocket? Does he stand with them behind? Yeah. What's the most mm -hmm. obvious stance and, and, and how casual could I look? I remember an acting teacher once saying that the reason a man can never totally mimic a woman's walk and vice versa is that they are constructed differently at the, <laughs> at the no, I mean, <laughs> at the hip, among other yes. places, and that uh, the, um, I forget which way it goes, that a man's leg tends to, a man tends to swing from the hip and a woman from the knee. No, I think it's the other way around. Well, that if you beats the hell out of me. I, I didn't get that far. But, to, but you did manage to bring it off, yeah. apparently. I think yeah. 
the one thing I noticed is that in general that men are more still than ladies. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure there are some very fussy people who, I mean, uh, there's a line in the film, it, it, you know, contrary to most popular belief, uh, there are all sorts of men who act in all sorts of ways as there are women. Yeah. But uh, in general, uh, a yeah. man is more still. You're, I'm talking and using my hands and my eyebrows and my face and you're being really quite still there. So, Am I? Yeah. <laughs> Too much? Yeah. It depends on nationality, of course. I expect, yes. Italians. Yes. Well, thank God I was just playing mm. something fairly still. You know, Tommy Toon, the director, did a, a brilliant thing off Broadway called The Club, and it was all women, and they were playing Victorian gentlemen, members of a club. And did they, was it fascinating? Yes, it was yeah. wonderful. And it was mysterious and strange and uh, brilliant. I don't know how yeah. they... He said he simply, at one point in rehearsal, said to have them imagine that they had something between their legs and that that helped their walking and so on. Yeah. It helps to imagine that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Worked for me. I didn't have the guts to say. I knew you were thinking that. <laughs> but there might be some Mary Poppins fans watching and who, who knows. Now, uh, it, it, was this based on something uh, that the uh, that the versatile Blake Edwards uh, dug up in research, or is uh, there no, such it a was, case? There or? was a film that was made, I believe, in 1934, and it was a German film, and uh, it was uh, written and directed, I believe, by a very brilliant German director who also wrote and directed the first um, *Some Like It Hot*. Mm -hmm. uh, some, uh, Billy Wilder adapted the German version of *Some Like It's It Hot*. Older version of yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. I didn't know that until we researched this film. Yeah, and transvestism was well, very the big theme in Germany. Well, the same in, in both of them. Yeah, yeah. As in uh, Marlena Dietrich. I guess. Constantly yeah, wear yeah. tuxedos and such things in those old films. Uh, you've been, you've been, uh, you, well, you've never been all the way down in a career, but because um, you, you started as a performer, and then with My Fair Lady, you were an instant star in the theater and so on. But you have been away, uh, which is supposed to be very dangerous. You're supposed to never dare get out of the public's eye in films, at least, for two, three years at a time, or it's curtains. It hasn't worked that way with you. <laughs> Why were you away? Well, I guess longevity has something to do with it. I mean, mm -hmm. if, you, if you are uh, around long enough, you kind of go down, and then you go up, and uh, you, know, you have your, it's like a graph. Life is like that. But didn't you choose to just stay out of for a while? Yeah, or? it was a combination of things, really. Um, I, it was very much partial choice. Blake and I were fairly recently married and his two children came to live with us my daughter was living with us and we really needed to make a family and uh, at the same time uh, i had made a film called star and then with him darling lily and both of them just went right down the tubes and i guess big musicals weren't being made around that time yeah they weren't very popular so the combination of the two i just thought okay i'll just take it easy and be a mum, and, and it was very pleasant. Is there any truth to the, uh, the cliché that you find out who your friends are when you've made a flop movie? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't think that's true. I mm -hmm. think if you've done the best job you know how, if you've really done a good film, then it, it's not so nice when it's a flop, but it isn't so bad either. I mean, it doesn't hurt quite so. If you've just dismissed it and not, well, one wouldn't do that anyway. Yeah. What's the true story? Uh, may I call you Julie? <laughs> After all these years. <laughs> you don't remember where we first met. Even under regression hypnosis, you couldn't possibly recall. Well, go on, refresh my memory. I crashed into your dressing room and what would it be, 1957? On the opening night in the whole world of My Fair Lady. In yeah, New Haven. it probably was 56 or 57. And I don't think I spoke to you, but... Um, For opening night in, in, on Broadway or out of town? In New Haven. In New Haven. <gasps> the God, night. no, I don't remember that. It was a historic but... night. I had paid a dollar eighty for a front row second balcony ticket. Oh. That'll give you some idea how long you ago. You saw my wigs on back to front and my hat on back to front and... Uh, and Moss Hart came up before the curtain and yeah. said that we all... People went, <gasps> as if there wasn't going to be a show, yeah. but they had trouble with turntables. or something. Everything went wrong that night. We ran about four hours. It was a blizzard outside. Do you remember Yeah, that? and it lasted till midnight yeah. and, or more and... Um, Nothing worked. And you, uh... At one point, Rex Harrison forgot his lyrics and went off stage and came back on in the middle of the song. <laughs> I don't remember that. <laughs> and I didn't realize until a couple of years ago, when he was here, that that was an accident. He, he, made, he carried it off so well, everyone assumed yeah. it was part of the show. Yeah. And you had on plaid pants backstage. Did I? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, must have made quite a big impression on you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, 
I really would like to know about the predicted reaction to the movie that uh, you and Blake made, SOB, in which people were saying they'll have to leave town if they release this thing. You know, I mean, they, they, you can't just cut out and cut at and caricature uh, the people in this town. They have no sense of humor. They'll ruin themselves. They'll be yeah. in rags. Since that hasn't happened, no, everybody uh, what seemed went to survive wrong? very well. <laughs> well, I guess we lost a few friends along the way, if one can call them that. Um, yeah. But, no, really not that much has changed. Mm. Uh, life goes on much as usual, but yeah. I'm very glad we did the picture. Is it your philosophy that if you did lose them, they weren't friends to begin Just with? Just about, uh, yeah. Uh, but there was, weren't there a lot of dire predictions that uh, he's really taking his career in his hands here by... Well, I think before people had seen it they thought that mm -hmm. and it's it's blake usually sugars his bitter pill with a lot of comedy and it's a very funny film yeah and uh, i think it was such a good film that it passed muster anyway it didn't do magnificently at the box office but uh, a, a, a series of mishaps has kept me from seeing it so i guess I, am i the only person in america who hasn't seen your bare bosom oh <laughs> i don't know about that <laughs> no, obviously yeah. not. <laughs> but so much was made of that that I'm sure you could gag yeah. over it. But uh, <clears throat> that w w what I didn't ever find out was was that an idea that you came up with during the making of the film? No, or was that, that, that was, was intended from written the right into the, yeah. It was in, yeah. It's actually the uh, it's the sort of one of the underlying themes of the film is is that I I do play a lady who. Do, did have my sort of image, that very clean, pure, square mm -hmm. image. And uh, Blake wanted to kind of strip it apart and take it away. Well, literally strip it apart and yeah. uh, take it all off. <laughs> and, so speak. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so it was a very necessary scene to the film. Mm -hmm. Film buffs, which includes almost everybody in college these days and mm -hmm. others, would like to know any scrap of information about Alfred Hitchcock, or anyone who's worked with, and books keep appearing about Hitchcock. And, mm -hmm. Uh, was Torn Curtain the only film you did? Yeah, with the only one I did for him. Yeah. yeah. He was an interesting man uh, to work for. He taught me a lot. I mean, he taught me a lot about cameras and lenses, and uh, I, you know, knew very little about it all and, and said so. And he said, Come with me. And he took me into his trailer and proceeded to draw diagrams. And, and, and he really gave me my first lesson in, in uh, the difference between close-ups and, and uh, how a certain lens can make your nose look extraordinarily long, which, and he said, never let anybody use that lens on you. <laughs> yeah. I have a long enough nose as it is, yeah. I had never noticed that. <laughs> what, what else would you have to know about lenses as an actor? Because some actors say uh, you just can't bother thinking about I think about he all felt that. that, for me, uh, being a lady especially, since ladies are supposed to always look ravishingly pretty and be shot very carefully, etc., that it would be something uh, like a precautionary thing to know. It would be useful. And uh -huh. uh, I, I'm still struggling to try and comprehend some of the lenses. I'm, I'm not very technically geared. I know basically, uh, the, the, thanks to him, the, the way it goes. He always claimed to not enjoy making movies. I think that he enjoyed conceiving the movies and he enjoyed planning the movies, but mm -hmm. he, yeah, he announced to all the day we started shooting that it was really over as far as he was concerned and this was just the boring part. The fun had ended. Which makes him feel terrific, yeah. <laughs> but does that mean that he did not work with the actors in terms of very motivation little. and nope, so very on little. And, and say, let's try to get a different edge on this scene and try to do it a little? No, he, he knew exactly how he wanted to set it up and uh, the effect he wanted to get. And he said, I think he was into manipulation of people uh, as much as anything. And, and as long as he got the setup he wanted and the effect that he wanted, he wasn't particularly interested in motivation. He, he, for instance, if, if, um, if a scene is very shocking or if you feel you want to cry, and if he could make the audience immediately after that emotion laugh with a feeling of release or relief, mm -hmm. then he felt that he, he'd done his work well. Those were the things he was after. Yeah. That's something you said there made me think of this, but I saw the other night a movie I'd never heard of, but Hitchcock made in 1934 or something, Rich and Strange. Never saw that. And it's a comedy about a sort of drab British couple who inherit some money and go off on a luxury cruise and each fall in love with someone else on the thing and eventually end up back in their rather drab middle-class lives. But in the middle of a very funny scene, and the boat sinks and the only one's left on it, <laughs> um, <laughs> There's suddenly a dead man there. 
and it's a kind of a grim shot of a dead man, and there's no joke connected with the dead man. And it wasn't being just there. Hitchcock doing his bit. And it wasn't Hitchcock. No. no, in fact, they didn't see him in it. Uh, and it's, I guess, that thing you're talking about that he liked. He seemed to like to almost as a sort of yeah. little practical joke yes. scare you. Or I remember asking him. He he said uh, I was doing a scene in an aeroplane, and the uh, door of the aeroplane is supposed to open. And he said, I just want you to turn and look. And I said, well, tell me what I'm looking at. What's coming toward me as the door opens? He said, it doesn't matter. Just turn and look. It'll, it'll work just fine. And I kind of argued, and I, I said, well, Hitch, just tell me anyway, because it would be nice to see the wheels turning in here. Mm -hmm. He said, it doesn't matter. And he wouldn't tell me. That is interesting. Yeah. As any director you'd think would say He just wanted it. that very still, uh, uh -huh. sort of impassive, I guess he wanted a, uh, that impassive look. Didn't want you to act too much. Yeah. Do you suppose it's true about that, that famous close-up of Garbo and the end of Queen Christina and everybody wondered what on earth was she thinking to get this unearthly look on her face? And, and the legend is that um, the director had simply said, think of nothing at all. And she did. <laughs> Which is not easy to do. No. no. Is there, in fact, such a thing as a four-octave voice? Aside oh, from yes. Amos Sumac? Oh, yeah. There is. Wait a minute. Four octaves. Because I read that you, as a child, had a four octave yeah, soprano I did. voice. So many famous singers are lucky to have one octave <laughs> and uh, no, most one and a half, two most maybe. Most coloraturas have at least three and a half, but four, uh, four at the age that I, I mean, I was about uh, 12 years old when I had a four octave voice, and that, I guess, was unusual. Well, now, what would your low note be in a four octave voice? I could do, I mean, not. Only, this was only for dogs in the neighborhood and, and, and <laughs> the occasional friend. I could hit a C below middle C and a C above high C. So, um, which what is, would a C below middle C sound like? Well, I couldn't do it now. I mean, no, that I mean, was then. Oh, I was just wondering how high you go above. Is ha ah, your low? Would that be your low? That's nearly mm -hmm. a middle C, so it would be and an octave below that. you could go 32 notes higher than that? <laughs> yes. No, no, no. No. Uh, I could Octives. go three octaves higher and one octave lower. Oh, I see. Yeah. You must have attracted bats when well, you were that about, yes. <laughs> Wow. Well, I, I, I also was able to do all these sort of mad vocal calisthenics. I mean, I could do incredible coloratura arias mm -hmm. and, and, and cadenzas and things like that. But what about, explains some people having that much? Is it different vocal cords apparently that Apparently, it was a very developed uh, adult larynx in a child. And mm -hmm. that's really what it was, I, I guess. Yeah. And a, a certain facility, I suppose. But it disappeared rather quickly. About when I was about 20, I'd gone through a lot of vocal changes. I don't think a girl's voice breaks like a man's does, but I do mm -hmm. believe it, it kind of shifts gears and, and adjusts itself and gets a little warmer and thicker. People assume because My Fair Lady was such an incredible success, uh, you, you might tend to think that it was, what am I trying to say, guaranteed from the beginning that it oh. would be uh, easy and a mm -hmm. bed of roses. And I, I, I read that you, uh, you had some difficult days with the late Moss Hart. Oh, yes, I did. Uh, did you think you were going to be fired? I thought I probably was going to be sent home. And I, that's a terrible feeling to have inside because it makes you worse. I'm, you know, the, the more mm -hmm. nervous you get, the, the, the more tight you get. But I, I just had no idea what I was doing and, and uh, was very green and, and, and hadn't really done any um, um, <coughs> dramatic roles ever. And this is certain, Eliza Doolittle is one of the great roles for a lady. It's got, you know, every variation, every, you do so many different things. And so Moss said, he must have had some faith in me, I guess, because he said, why don't we dismiss the company for a weekend uh, during rehearsals, and you and I will just work together. And that's what we did. And it was like going to the dentist to have a tooth pulled. You know it's going to hurt like hell, but you come out feeling better afterwards, and that's sort of what happened. What kind of thing did he think was wrong with you? Oh, <laughs> I don't think there was much right in those days. Uh, he said you lack everything and began no, no, from no. there? No, no, no. He, he altern alternately bullied and cajoled and pleaded and was sweet and encouraging. And I guess I needed all of that. Um, he, he did one of those masterful things. You know, he was sort of Svengali and, and pulled out this, this character for me. And he showed me a lot, too. Could you argue with him? Oh, uh, he was wonderfully funny and very, very human, very real. Yeah. No, he was easy to talk to, very loving. In fact, I really do uh, uh, owe him everything. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you had said, I'm afraid you're on 
you just ask me to do something I can't do. Why well, don't you get I mean, yourself another girl? I think you think that anyway. You always oh. feel that, yeah. that, that somebody's asking the impossible. But the fact that they consistently have faith in you is a kind of underlying something that you hold on to. And I, he said afterwards, uh, I was telling it on myself, but he, his, he went home to his wife and she said, well, how, how was she after this dreaded 48 hours was over? And he said, ah, oh, she has that terrible British strength that makes you wonder why they lost India. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you assume that someone from England can do every British accent, mm, but you, me. in fact, had to be taught to yeah. do one of your home country accents. Yeah, couldn't. Yeah. Uh, I can pick, I can, like, I guess being a singer, I can learn to do something, but I don't hear it immediately. Mm. Uh, certainly, I didn't hear a Cockney accent immediately. Well, I had so much else to worry about, too. So Did I was taught by an American professor of phonetics. Did they teach you phonetically? Yes, yes. Make you... yep. What was the sound that was hard to get for you? Oh, I think it wasn't just any one sound. It was a consistent use of, and not falling back into an mm -hmm. ordinary English accent, but to really bend everything. Yeah. It never occurs to a lot of people that a whole nation pronounces a certain vowel one way, at least a certain class of people, and never another. Mm. Uh, in the difference between, how would you pronounce the word G-O-T in the sentence, I have mm, to go now. I have got to go now? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because where I come from, you'd say got. Got to go. And the phonetic symbol for that is very different. That's the A in father. Well, I know. Instead of the A oh, that you say in got. Uh, when I'm, even to this day, when I sing something like I could have danced all night, mm -hmm. I kind of split it right down the middle. I don't say danced and I don't say danced. I sort of say danced. <laughs> that is, you did, as they say, too many times in our business, split the difference. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only thing that's said more often than have fun with it, by people who are telling you what to do and can't describe what they mean. Mm -hmm. Split the difference, that's of right. course. Uh, do, you, do you like James Garner as much as I do? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. He is amazing. I often think of him as perhaps the most fabulously successful, underrated actor in the business because he makes everything look so easy. And, and very, very good, so yeah. So effortless. And I've he, watched him on the set when he does it, and it's just yeah. marvelous. Blake was uh, talking about him the other day and saying that the thing he needed in Victor Victoria was a brilliant reactor, a man who reacts, because uh, uh -huh. obviously uh, in the film, James Garner comes and sees me performing and thinks that I am a lady. Before I'm beautifully dressed and wonderful wigs and everything. And of course, at the end of the scene, I take my wig off and I am, he thinks, a man. And it's a terrible shock to him because he's fallen in love with what he thinks is a lady. And now everything about his sexuality is challenged. And of course. So, on. so and his reactions are just wonderful. Uh, he's the master of those, master of those things. Master of it, and it couldn't have been better. I'm sorry, master, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and also the master. Yes. Let, let's look at a piece of tape right now, which is a scene from the film. What should we know about this going in? I think the piece you're going to be shown is uh, the first really big production. In other words, it's, it's Victoria's opening night. She is playing a female impersonator. Uh, the audience uh, doesn't know that she's really a man, so you'll be seeing a woman. It's her first big opening night production number. Okay. Here it is. shortened version of the jazz hot <laughs> you were the one with the black hair seated at the table weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's a, I, I can't imagine how you kept it straight in your head what you were supposed to be at what point in it that really film. was confusing and I mean, and uh, it kind of turned me inside out a little bit uh, really yeah. it did I'm, I'm not being uh, facetious about it did you study impersonators uh, a little bit our choreographer was going to see their yeah. acts at clubs yeah that have them um, and we, I had a lot of help because our choreographer said, now, usually female impersonators are very still. Uh, the action happens all around them. You, you, uh, whereas I probably would kick out and dance and move a great deal mm -hmm. uh, because you are trying to give an illusion. They give themselves than away being, if yeah. they do too many That's right. and yeah. things. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, uh, do you believe in having a show business childhood? We only have a minute <laughs> left, but I didn't realize that when you... I, I keep forgetting that you were in your teens, weren't you, when you... Yeah. We're alone in America. Well, uh, I'm glad now I, that I did. I think that I probably missed out on a few things, like a really good education and things like that. But with the things that I'm called upon to do these days, or any day, I'm fairly glad I did have that experience.
And it's all right to work with your husband, apparently. Uh, oh, it's very nice it's to do that. Obligatory uh, yeah. woman's magazine the interview on the question, yes. of course. But uh, uh, does he ever want to act, your husband? Well, he used to. I mean, now does he get the itch to? Well, when he has a tantrum, yeah. he acts brilliantly at, at home. <laughs> 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 but uh, no, he. He doesn't want to anymore, but, but he did do a couple of films in his youth, and he was yeah. just marvelous. And also, uh, when he's showing someone what he wants, once in a while, I, I get a glimpse of how good he could be. Yeah. Talk him into it and let him let you direct it. <laughs> well, I, I think he'd be a fine actor. I'd be a lousy director. And Carol Burnett could be the script girl, and you'd have a lot of laughs. Fine. Do you ever see her? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I met her uh, a couple of months ago, and, oh, she's a good chum. Yeah. You two together are magical. Yeah, we were hoping that we could get together again, and, and unfortunately, um, the logistics this time, I mean, whereas we were able to twice before do a show together, suddenly mm -hmm. budgets become all important, and it's too prohibitive, and it's just crazy. You can have some of mine. Thank you. We got budget here. Funded by this station if and we many could only others, find right? it. Yeah. And other television yeah, stations. That's right. Julie Andrews, thank you for being here. It was a being pleasure. So nice.